as an introduction, I'm Seamus Madigan. I work for uh, Flex Energy Storage Solutions. We're uh, working uh, in distributed energy as part of bringing the balance of plan uh, for enclosures. So we provide uh, systems that envelope batteries to ensure that they perform within warranties or, or any other technology for energy storage applications as well. And um, we have a fantastic panel here today that we're going to go and try and answer some of this enabling distributed energy resources into the grid and figuring out how people can hopefully monetize some of that and uh, and and also provide this this need to feed the addiction for power okay so I'll open up with Clay so I'm Clay Collier co-founder of Kisensum I thought he was gonna say the most popular thing in the airport is the yoga room but um, <laughs> that's maybe that's only SFO so what I'll do is I'm gonna flip through some of the projects that we work on that just show you the gamut of stuff that's going on out there without trying to make it a commercial about key sensum. By the way, the name's hard to pronounce. Key is Sumerian for earth. Sensum is Latin for awareness. If you make up a name, you get a domain without having to buy it off that kid in New Jersey. So we saved a lot of money. All right, so. So our background was developing open automated demand response. We were doing the demand load automation uh, at a company called the Kuacom, which is a predecessor to this. And one of the projects we were working on there was the LA Air Force Base Vita G. Uh, we sold Sensum to Honeywell, and we got a call from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and their partners, the DOD and CEC, and said, we're gonna do this V2G project and we need the software. So that's, that's how we started. So our customers and partners in that project, both Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, originally with Scylla Kilichodi and Doug Black. Scylla's now at, at Slack, Stanford. So this was a big partner project. You got the Department of Defense, California Energy Commission, a couple of the utilities. You got a lot of people trying to figure out how can we take the car batteries from a fleet of electric vehicles and make it an energy storage application. Cool idea, bit more complicated than they thought it was, so software became interesting. This project took about 30 vehicles that were either electric vehicles, buses, trucks, vans, battery size from a Nissan Leaf on up, and what the idea is you take the batteries and you aggregate them into a 500 kW chunk of energy and you can trade it in the CalISO market. So what that means is every four seconds, the CalISO sends a signal saying go up 10 kW, down 100 kW, up 50 kW, down 10. And every four seconds, my aggregate set of batteries has to hit that point. It's very fast. You know, batteries are as fast as you get. So when they're trying to balance the grid for intermittent renewables and cycles, it's a great asset. That's what this project was all about. Uh, the idea, the, it's hard though, because you need 500 kWs. A lot of these, you gotta get all these cars in, in synchronous working. Um, and that's what it looks like. If you look at, it, it was very, when I said very fast load, you, what you see is the red is the, the submeter at the point of the vehicles, the blue is the signal from the KISO, and it is logically synchronized within four seconds. Uh, we did the same thing. We do, we're doing three military bases around the United States, one in PJM territory, Joint Base Andrews, and one in ERCOT in uh, Fort Hood, Texas. And it's all the same thing. You know, we, we do different services to the grid using the batteries, and you can actually monetize the vehicles. Uh, we're doing a project right here in our backyard at Alameda County, where we're simply doing smart charging. So this is with the Alameda County team and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and uh, ChargePoint, using the ChargePoint network. And what happened was Alameda County was doing demand response, and then they just installed 40 chargers with no controls, and they blew the demand response parameters. So now we cycle the charge across the cars, keeping the load flat. So you'll hear the guys at an ISO or utility complain about the volatility of the load. By smart charging across a fleet, you keep it flat. Um, this project was with EVGo, one of the leading deployers of car charging infrastructure. At UC San Diego, what they did is 
built a photovoltaic canopy over the DC fast charging, you get a double advantage. You get a little shade, believe it or not, I like it. You get photovoltaic generation. Then we took a bunch of second life batteries that have been removed from electric vehicles, BMWs, stacked them up behind the fence. So now I've got the utility input, I've got the battery input, I've got the photovoltaic input, and I can optimize, again, how flat my utility load is to reduce the bill, and again, keep, the, keep it neutral while fast charging cars. You know, these guys are coming up with DC fast charging. Um, so that was a dashboard showing the blue line is what I wanna keep the utility charge at, because that's my maximum demand charge. Don't let it go up. And I use the, the orange line is the battery to, into the vehicle instead of the utility. And you'll notice when, when cars get nearly charged, they slow down electric vehicles, so you get a slowdown effect, and then you'll actually go negative when, when you finish charging, so I can recharge my batteries. Um, there's a gamut of projects coming up, and I'm pretty happy about some of these. One of them is Proterra buses, which is a big batteries. I mean, you get 250 kWh batteries, that's a great asset. We're doing that at Silicon Valley Transit. We're doing um, mobile home park with uh, CSE, where you're taking a photovoltaic and batteries and minimizing the cost. We're doing, um, and by the way, the um, Prospect Silicon Valley is the, is the partner and the leader of the project that we're doing with Proterra buses at Silicon Valley Transit. Then we're doing one that's pretty cool, and the Google campus has 1,300 electric vehicle chargers right now, and that's not enough. So Stanford has a project where we're, we're gonna work with Google, and we're gonna work with non-resi fleet and optimize the effect on the grid of how you control, uh, balance that. All right, so I just wanted to run through this and say there's a lot of stuff, I'm happy to say, going on to integrate energy storage, electric vehicle charging, and help the grid. You know, by flattening out the load, you're helping the grid. And I'll hand it over. Thanks. Next, we have Neil from, Neil from Adara Power. All right, hi, everybody. I'm Neil McGuire. Uh, founder and CEO of Adara Power. Um, we are a residential and commercial energy storage uh, software provider. Um, we are located in San Jose, not too far from here. And uh, we started our company in 2013 under the name Juice Box Energy. Um, we changed to Adara. Adara is one of the brightest stars in the night sky. So I'll just take you real quick through our behind the, more, behind the meter um, solutions. Uh, the challenge uh, is the complexity. Um, we have 3,000 different utilities in the United States when you look at uh, municipalities, uh, co-ops, and investor-owned utilities. There are 260,000 workers in the solar uh, industry, and these folks are great about snapping panels together, but they do not know a lot about advanced lithium-ion uh, battery storage. And we have gigafactories around the world producing batteries, Panasonic, which Tesla uses, LG Chem, which we use, uh, Samsung. And we have a whole bunch of inverter companies uh, developing latest and greatest technologies. So what we're doing is we're putting together a site controller and a software stack, as well as engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with uh, permitting offices and interconnection um, groups and supporting our 260,000 solar installers. Um, as I mentioned, we started in 2013. We have product uh, deployed in 13 states and um, uh, 125 installers that we've trained and certified. Um, each of these systems does peak shifting, takes uh, solar from the middle of the day and, and shifts it into the evening. So we've offset over 25 megawatt hours of what otherwise would be uh, gas peaker plant production or worse yet, coal. We are now shifting um, completely towards the commercial market. So the, so the software that we built doesn't care if you plug in a five kilowatt inverter or a 125 kilowatt inverter. This inverter from Delta is the latest uh, and greatest we can find, a 97.5% efficiency, very cheap price point, integrated AC and DC disconnects, and it comes with LG Chem battery racks in an outdoor enclosure. So what we do is we add our site controller and the software stack to it. And we've been engaging with uh, solar installers now uh, across California and winning a number of uh, self-generation incentive program projects. This is our software. All of this is released software. 
So if you put in a fleet of these products, you have your own fleet management view, and the building owner or the homeowner has a variety of different views. And really, most importantly, from being able to maintain a fleet is this very detailed electrical performance di and diagnostics chart. So we have all of the inverter parameters and battery parameters. We can dig down into what's going on at the, at the grid, at the load on a, at a facility, and through a remote connection, update parameters or update firmware. And so we, we do service uh, remotely without anybody having to go out to the site. This is the latest uh, California self-generation incentive program. Um, California has the best market in the world right now for energy storage. The current step pays $400 a kilowatt hour um, and the systems only cost maybe $760 a kilowatt hour. Um, so this is data from um, the latest uh, report. Tesla um, certainly has uh, the process down in California here. Um, we ended up uh, in sixth place out of 23 different battery companies. And so what we're doing now is engaging um, many solar installers across uh, California because uh, it's a very complicated incentive uh, process and uh, we've mastered it. This is uh, data from a publicly available report. Um, so we have the Adara system here on the far left at around $785 per kilowatt hour. This is the complete installed cost, general contractor label, uh, labor, concrete pads, conduit, batteries, inverters, and our, our software controller. And you see some of the other people on there too. So by having a very flexible and uh, scalable software platform, we're able to get the latest and greatest batteries and inverters to market very rapidly. So thanks, and I look forward to more discussion. All right, Paul from Black & Veatch. The hardest, the hardest part of it. So uh, I'm Paul Stith with Black and & Veatch, um, and I'm gonna talk pretty briefly about the things that we're doing. We're doing a lot of things, if you're not familiar with Black & Veatch, just a little quick introduction to that, and then move through kind of rapidly some of the couple things that I thought were important if we're gonna be talking about DERS, um, and we'll just jump right in. So if you're not familiar with our company, we're, we're kind of big, and a lot of people don't know us. If you do know us, you know us really well in the energy space. Um, we've been around for about 102 years now, so um, a lot of things in water, a lot of things in energy, and about half of our offices, a little more than that, are, are here in the U.S., anywhere around the world. Um, 12,000 employees, and we are actually an employee-owned company, so we're a little bit unique. We don't have to kind of respond exactly to what the stock exchange thinks of us on one particular day or, or, or whatnot, so we can do a little more long-term thinking. Um, and my role is actually as director in strategy and innovation is to figure that out for our team. Um, talked about the markets a little bit. Um, I'm a particular specialist technology-wise in energy storage and uh, electric vehicles. So from our, our map here. The thing to point out, though, as I have it, is in telecommunications, that's a model that we developed over 20, 25 years ago to deploy hundreds and thousands of assets. And it's one that we leverage across the electric vehicle space and energy storage to do massive concurrent projects that have very intricate timelines, a lot of jurisdictions, a lot of important things for working with utilities, be able to do it in mass scale. And that's, that comes out of our telecommunications heritage. And we plug in with our energy side, and you kind of have an interesting picture where we can work with the utilities as well. Um, and water turns out to be one of our, our larger divisions as well, and that's wastewater treatment. Uh, Silicon Valley has got some pretty cool work that we've done around here. Um, there's some little footprint thing, and then we have our international offices. We are based in uh, Overland Park, Kansas. Um, 
interesting about our headquarters, it is one of the largest ones in the states. It's also probably one of the only ones with a fully functional microgrid that we built for our uh, resources for training and to explore technologies. Um, this is just a little thing. So I'm with a small, small sliver of this large company, um, uh, which is called Transformative Technologies. This is a footprint which is actually outdated. We're uh, rapidly approaching about 800 sites of the work that we do, which are high power, um, electric vehicle charging, as well as energy storage. Um, and this is just kind of a map, and some of it in smart cities. Um, some of it actually is hydrogen infrastructure. Um, I'm very excited about what we're doing also in autonomous, because we get to bring together the energy, as well as our communications capabilities. We do things like building fiber optic networks, we build cellular networks, and so forth. So as you bring these, these things together, it's actually pretty cool. Um, this is just a few of the things that we're working at. You can kind of see some logos there of the types of uh, organizations that we support. Um, and it's national as far as the work. And some of it's very far reaching out into the early stages when we're doing master planning for communities, looking at their energy, telecommunications, what they're going to do with their water, um, all the way through to, as I mentioned, deploying assets. Um, these numbers are a little bit farther behind. We're probably about 300 megawatts of charging capacity. Uh, energy storage is somewhere around about 150 behind the meter uh, megawatts, and then um, many more um, available actually uh, across the other side of the meter in utility scale. What I want to start with real quick is this thing on DERS. What do they mean? This is actually some work we did with SMUD. Uh, it's been referenced by SEPA and a few others around that we've developed some white papers on it. How do you plan for these DERS? And my colleagues, so I'm an EV specialist in this, is these are all the different things, EVs, energy efficiency, demand response, solar, rooftop solar, uh, deployed energy storage. What does that actually look like? So we did some work with SMUD, they have 600,000 meters, and this was a study to figure out in 2030 what it's gonna look like at every single meter, and then you translate that into the bulk power and the transmission, the transformers, and so forth. Some pretty interesting findings, for example, in the EV space, that you may need to replace as many as 70% of the transformers if you don't start doing smart charging. Um, and that's a pretty important thing when you're looking at the capital involved. So pretty cool stuff, some analytics, some uh, looking forward, and this cycle that if you start out in your strategy and operations, if you're, say, the utility side, the dirt potential, what it's gonna do for your transmission uh, distribution grid and a bulk power all the way back over to creating rate structures. So if you're in a, the prior session, you've got utilities trying to figure out, well, how do we create a good rate structure? We work with utilities, but also look for an eye to how you create markets that would be successful. Um, so this is a study just kind of out front, and we just finished a fleet analysis for SMUD as well on EVs, what's going to look like for school buses, what's going to look like for uh, logistics networks, uh, transit, and so forth, as a market opportunity for SMUD to figure out how to encourage the great behavior and growth of that market that's going to make sense for the rate case. Um, this is some results. If you look at DERS, you start putting them together, there's another slide that's really stackable, but the bright story in this one is actually EV, because EV is a new load. Most of the other things are actually taken away for utilities. So you need to start to figure out if you end up with less load, then your cost per kilowatt hours are going to go up. And so what are you going to do about that? So we, we kind of want to get ahead of these things. And again, same cycle, but it's part of the work. This is, um, and I want to just throw a project or two here. So with Southern California Edison, our client is um, Advanced Microgrid Solutions. Um, this is deploying over 20 locations, 50 megawatts of energy storage. So this is where you go from the small into the big, and how are you going to deliver that in, in Class A office space? So very exciting project, but you're doing multiple value streams of that storage. You don't even export power across the meter. You actually just make the building disappear off the grid, and you're going to end up with a potential of 50 megawatts. You go to 20 sites export from the battery. It's pretty cool stuff. So we do these programs that are like that to roll it out um, and, and deal with all of the issues from engineering design, permitting through construction. Um, and that this is just real quick, the types of ways you do those sorts of projects, how you have to be aligned. We run about 7,000 projects at once. So this methodology is very uh, well tuned. Customers, how do you keep track of what you're doing in a, in a massive deployment? Um, a few more pictures of a couple sites, and I think that's what I wanted to share with you. Thanks. And then last member of our panel is Paul, for our, our, sorry, Adam from, um, from Autogrid. Thank you. 
So my name is Adam Todorsky. Um, I work for a company here in Silicon Valley called uh, AutoGrid Systems. And um, we are addressing these, uh, the challenges that are created by the uh, transformation in our, in our um, energy systems. So the um, theme of grid edge is, uh, is, is uh, everyone's aware with you know, how disruptive that is, but what does that really mean and how do you make money off of it? So um, my personal background, I, I had a, actually a company that was a contemporary of, of Clay's uh, a company at Kuacom on the East Coast doing uh, automated demand response controls back 12 years ago. And that was addressing kind of the middle of this cone here. So the, the concept of, of grid edge uh, uh, transformation or, or migration of traditional grid services, which I listed across the top, where you do things from you know, planning how much power I'm going to need in a given place at a given point in the future, to um, actually dispatching it, to um, managing uh, for things like contingencies and, and changes in, in your system from hour to hour, five minute to five minute, second to second to, to sub-second all the way at the tip out there. Um, as, the, as you start to do those things with things that aren't power plants, that aren't wires, that aren't traditional resources, you have to um, apply software to, to, to manage that, right? Like you, you can't just have a big spinning piece of metal in a generator that actually does a bunch of these things by virtue of being heavy. You need code to, to, um, to make sure that uh, lots of little resources can communicate, that you know what they're doing, that you can forecast what they're going to do. So by, by way of introduction and background, so, so I, I had a couple of companies that did event-based DR controls, and then I had a company on the East Coast that did um, uh, virtual power plant technology. We had a, a big penetration in New York ISO. And um, now Autogrid uh, is a provider of software solutions to enable others to uh, to go out and do those things. So the, um, what, what's starting to happen is, is the, the number of ways in which you can monetize these, while elusive in some spaces, are, are many, and the number of different types of resources, rooftop PV, residential behind the meter storage, CNI behind the meter storage, in front of the meter storage, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it, it's exploding now. So, and this is a really exciting time to be in this business. So um, I touched on this a, a little bit already. So you have this, um, multi-dimensional situation that arises out of that opportunity on the first slide and the market uh, structures or market functions, uh, I shouldn't say market system functions, uh, that we talked through on the second slide, um, where you've got different classes of assets, different ways in which you can monetize them, um, but the, and different uh, business models you can build around that, but the kind of core thing you need in all of those, uh, uh, or to, to pull all of those things together, is, um, is software. So, okay, so a little bit about Autogrid specifically. So Autogrid has two kind of core products. Uh, what we do is provide a tool uh, to manage the flexibility resources. It's Autogrid Flex. And we have another tool called Autogrid Engage, which primarily a utility tool, but not necessarily, is meant for uh, utilities to reach out and engage their end users to uh, you know, the people who actually own those PV rooftop systems, the people who, who have those, drive those EVs, the people who participate in those demand response programs to um, connect that human element to the system. So you might do something as simple as telling uh, tell, some of our utilities are still messaging, uh, replace your, your incandescent light bulbs with LEDs, all the way to I've got behind the meter storage and I want to see what it's doing, I, or, or maybe I'm a commercial industrial customer and I actually want to submit some sort of financial transaction. Um, uh, maybe I want to bid my, my load flexibility at a certain time. Um, so that's what Engage does, and, and Flex is a combination of a demand response management system, virtual power plant, distributed energy resource management system, and it uses this um, uh, analytics platform that we've built. Um, and it's big. We have about two and a half gigawatts of um, contracted loads. So this is, this is kind of the subtle thing about Autogrid that, like, those, those radio one-way pager switches that people put on air conditioners to shed load at peak times 20 years ago, there are millions of those out there that they're still used and work today. So whereas before, the utility would say, ah, oh, geez, it's a hot day. We've got to, you know, we, we either need to crank up a really expensive peaker in the afternoon, or oh, why don't we hit those load control switches, but also crank up the peaker, because we don't really know what we're going to get out of the load control switches. Well, with software, you can forecast exactly what you're going to get when you fire that bullet, because the switches don't communicate back, right? Like, that's the key thing that's, that's missing, that exists with the, the, the modern uh, technologies that the other panelists uh, um, touched on in their, their intros, but 
th those don't have a lot of scale yet. That, that's changing, but that's, um, there are already millions and millions of connected devices out there that are dumb. So how do you, how do you integrate those with the new connected, more connected devices that are, are more intelligent, that give you feedback? And the answer is software. So in a nutshell, that's what Autogrid does, and we, we quietly manage huge fleets of really dumb devices, for lack of better description, for, uh, for um, uh, some pretty big utilities alongside uh, more modern resources. Uh, so that's my intro. Thank you. So I think moving on, what we'll try and do is, uh, uh, given the fact that we have uh, plenty of ideas in, um, from all of the members of the panel, I was going to ask each, each one of the panel members to give one or, two idea, one or two things that they believe today encourages DER introduction and, and, and uh, connection into, the, into grid stability and figuring out how to actually make that work. And then uh, one or two things that they feel are roadblocks today in, in uh, making sure that the ideas and our products and solutions that each of you bring to the market today, uh, some of the challenges that you see and how it's actually affecting what you do on a day-to-day -day business point of view. So first thing that comes to mind to me is consumer awareness. Consumer awareness generally drives markets. So if you look at it right now as a consumer of electricity and the guy that pays the bill, I turn on the switch, the light works, I'm okay. Am I aware of the fact that there are great inefficiencies in the delivery of that electricity or that there are harmful side effects or that global warming is a real thing? Am I aware of that? Am I going to pay for it? Am I going to act on it? That reminds me of the story when we did car navigation at first. You know, selling that in Detroit was darn near impossible. It'd say, nope, I just installed a new leather map holder. I don't need navigation. Because there was no consumer awareness of what it could do. So I'd say right now, that's number one. Because consumer awareness is going to be, you know, we want clean energy. We want clean air. You know, we see a benefit in it, and we'll do it. And it's not, Steve Wesley gave a presentation this morning with some great numbers. You know, 83 million people are going to die of respiratory disease in China. Man, there's some consumer awareness. Anyway, so that's my number one. Number two, and this happens in concert, is that as consumers rise up to say, I'll pay the half cent or I'll take an action, then you get scale. Then you get cheap inverters. You know, it costs at a military base, it costs $20,000 to install a bi directional inverter. That doesn't scale as a market. You need the car companies to embrace it and stick it in every car. So these two things somewhat happen together. But when you get consumer awareness and the market rears its head and says, I want it, and they apply it at scale, it gets cheaper. And again, I thought Steve Wesley's numbers this morning on the cost of storage. You know, you look at those statistics, and yeah, he's got a good point. OK, from my standpoint, um, you know, we look at uh, there's two aspects. One is the technology. Is the technology ready for demand response programs? And so um, in the case of Adara, every system that we put out there since day one is connected through the internet. It has uh, a set of APIs that can be called upon to uh, discharge um, based on maybe a higher level aggregator or our own virtual power plant uh, technology. So I think the days of doing pilots are, should be wrapping up at this point because the technology has been you know, developed and deployed. It, and it's really time to just execute programs. So the other part is, so you got technology that's ready, but is there a market signal for it? So as we deploy behind the meter storage, we're doing it based on an ROI or some uh, resiliency need for a particular customer. Now those customers are just a shotgun across the country. So there's not a concentration right now of our systems in any one particular circuit on the PG&E uh, distribution network that actually makes a, a big difference. So, um, but if there is a, another payment stream on top of what that customer is already getting the value out of it for, then you know, there's, there's just a natural um, ability, uh, incentive to join in and participate in those programs. So the technology's there, it's developed, um, and we just need to see that revenue stream formalized and just widespread and move way, way beyond demonstration type projects. So uh, Neil just stole one of mine, but that's okay. Um, the, 
the, establishing the value for these assets and creating a marketplace is, is huge. So we, you saw in the Dur analysis type work that we're doing, getting in front of that with utilities, with stakeholders, and understanding what are the trajectories of those technologies, what are those adoption curves, because you're not in a vacuum. I think maybe that's what I'll twist this to, is that you need to look at all of the Durs that are coming up. You've got EV, you've got energy efficiency, demand response, energy storage, rooftop solar. All of these things are actually coming available and be a controllable, and the adoption curves for each of those are something that you need to really think about uh, in terms of deployments. Um, I'm going to just understanding the data and sharing, working to share. Um, the other that I'll, I'll jump out to is is actually large DERS. So we're working in in say for example transit charging or large electric vehicle fleets that you're going to have. Um, maybe 100, 200 chargers of high power. We're looking at facilities that are 5, 10, 20 megawatts worth of charging in one parking garage. So how are those DERS going to look in the future when you bring them together, couple it with storage? Um, I think in my, my re reply and thinking of the panel here was, how do we do intelligent deployment of capital? Because there's going to be some huge amounts of capital to be spent in order just to be able to, say, charge those vehicles. Well, gosh, if you have that large of a bandwidth, a pipe to the grid, um, then why don't you put batteries there? And why don't you create that 24-hour stream that is going to be valuable to both sides of a meter? And who knows? Maybe it's not a both sides of the meter. Maybe it's the utilities are finding ways to intelligently deploy capital so those grid upgrades don't need to be made, and you're ending up with uh, turning on assets. My biggest nightmare that I try to help our clients figure out is, if you're going to deploy, say, electric vehicle fleet, what if you have to wait two years for a feeder in order to have one of these new heavy-duty DERS in the market? You need to be able to find ways to solve it much faster. So on the opportunity side, or the, the um, uh, uh, class of things that are creating these opportunities are... Um, they're not just new things. They're things like FERC Order 755, which um, caused uh, uh, a big storage boom on the, the grid side in PJM. Um, one of my failed startups played with that. Uh, so initially, you could make 300 grand a megawatt uh, year just selling battery, selling frequency regulation from battery storage into the into the grid, and that caused people to build hundreds of megawatts of storage, or, or start building, I should say, hundreds of megawatts of storage until the projects got completed. Um, so that type of thing, uh, you see that all over the place. You see like the Con Ed BQDM non-wire alternative, uh, where the, in the Brooklyn Queens demand management zone, you're, you're paying a lot of money for people to come in, build storage, or come up with creative load management mechanisms to shift load, um, so to, to, to defer the uh, construction of a new substation or a new feeder. That type of thing happens all over the place. And again, it spurs, uh, it's, it's, it, those are the, the big opportunities spurring the, the adoption of these distributed energy resources. But the, um, the flip side of that is that those, uh, so on the, the detraction side, is that those opportunities like the, the FERC Order 755 boom then bust in PJM, I think is probably the best example of this. They're, they're, they're short-lived unless they like, get fundamentally rolled into the structure of the market or the, if in a vertically integrated utility into their, their rate case. Um, so unless that happens, um, unless you do more than one thing with the resource, it's not a long-term viable business. And, and if you, and if you had go in, as, as I did at my last company, kind of speculating that it would evolve, it doesn't evolve that quickly. And, and it's, it's very difficult to deploy capital. A lot of, you know, these things are expensive, to, to, to your point, to just having the wires extended, to citing the battery, pouring the concrete, I mean, it's expensive, so he's got to pay for that. Um, there's an opportunity in there, which is if you can use software instead of you know, concrete and wires and really big batteries to aggregate up uh, um, things you already have, water heaters, air conditioners, EV chargers, um, then, then you, you can maybe sidestep that, that stymie. And the other one is on the, the standardization behind the technology. I'm um, st standing in for a, uh, a project manager at, at AutoGrid right now um, to manage a DERMS deployment that we're doing at, a, at a, a sizable utility here in the US. And the hardest problem managing this project is getting the vendors of all of the batteries that we have to connect to to talk to our software. Like they have APIs, okay, great, what's your API? Well, it's this thing that you're gonna have to write a bunch of custom code to support. Okay, and you, you know, an hour later, I've got a call with another battery vendor and it's a completely different custom API. Or they'll take some, uh, some, some standard um, and they will um, stick stuff on it that's not part of the standard to make, make that work. So um, 
and, and it's no, there's no one or gr small group of entities that are doing this. Like everybody's guilty of this, right? Like it's it's a relatively nascent industry. The the yeah, the hardware is coming of age. The software, like lots of people are developing a lot of uh, putting a lot of R and D money into that development. But it's 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 a it's both a a opportunity and also a gigantic impediment to deploying this stuff at at scale. Um, but we're working through it. Um, looking at all of the projects that, that all four of you worked on, it looks like uh, you know capital investment is a big issue as well. And if you if you take uh, the uh, the inverters is is a, actually a very good example of that because if you look at the traditional OEMs like the ABBs or some of those other guys who are now competing with folks who have been in solar for a long time with uh, with what they're doing inverters sma is a good example where th those guys have been under pressure for pricing for for years you know tens of years probably even and um the price of batteries specifically lithium ion over the last couple of years has come down dramatically there's even uh, numbers thrown around by some of the larger korean folks who are doing 180 dollars a kilowatt hour do you think that that change in capital investment is also having or playing a big role in adoption of distributed energy resources or, or actual um, the increase in the number of projects or is it is it purely a, a, a grid instability or grid stability need that's being addressed? So um, I think it's a uh, it's a combination of both so you had at thousand dollars a kilowatt hour you had a small number of problems you would solve with batteries at 500 you had a larger number and at 180 you have you know, a, a very large number, so it's a pretty simple you know, inverse relationship. But um, I, I, again, to the point I made on, on the, um, the, the both the opportunities that are relatively short-lived is you, you have to, even at $180, you still have to build those that infrastructure to support connecting that battery. So that you, you, it, it doesn't, the battery has to get almost free, like it's, it's, it's already there because it's part of some other system. Uh, before you you can get away with only having one value stream, so that's why stacking optimization are, are critical. Yeah, I, I would just say that uh, the falling battery prices, um, you know, the 180 might be a sell level price if you're you know selling into Chevy Volts and all the volume behind that. But you know, from my chart from the SGIP uh, project. The in the ground cost is between seven hundred and fifty and twelve fifty dollars per kilowatt hour. So what we do is, um, you know, it, it's great to have a, a technology that's capable of demand response and, and some of the grid services. But ultimately, we're selling to a building owner, and that building owner needs an ROI not on some future projects, but here and now. So if you look at the demand charges in PG&E, for instance. Uh, in the E9, if you have an E19 commercial rate, um, it's $19 per kilowatt. And so um, when battery prices now are down to the level that we have, uh, that's an ROI immediately. And now you have this big California incentive program on top of it. There sh should be just no reason why, other than I need a lot more salespeople, to go and just keep lining up uh, commercial customers that have high usage in the evening that are on E19 rate. So it's just a flat out ROI story at this point with the batteries at the price that they're at. You know, I'll just throw in the comment. Again, it's technology evolution and market evolution. So right now we're at the advantage of things like SGIP. I'm happy to be here in California, thank you. You know, we have incentives that encourage manufacturers to try. And they want to compete and they're going to compete and some of them will lose. It's a little bit of an uphill slippery race. But the, the manufacturers and partners who put together compelling combinations are gonna win and win big and create a market. So you say the guy that could put together solar with storage, with car charging on a scalable basis is gonna be a winner and he's gonna get a faster ROI and he's gonna go to scale faster. But at this point, yeah, we're, we're gonna have you know, iterations of people trying it with too much cost and the return of investments too slow and people are running around them and coming up with more compelling combos. Okay. Um, one of the earlier panels today dealt a little bit with security and connecting to the cloud and having, I mean, data is obviously a huge thing for the likes of Autogrid and, and certainly for Adara as well and, and for you, Clay, too. How, how are you guys dealing with that, with NERC SIP compliance if it's needed, if customers even know about it or what it's supposed to do for them? Because most DERs are actually smaller scale projects. They don't actually, 
or I should say they're not being forced uh, to comply with NERC-SIP and, and is there, uh, do you see an, an option if you look at some of the news that came out earlier this week with, with the Ukrainian power plants being, uh, being uh, hacked and so on, like what are your thoughts on that and that kind of challenge that that offers or, or I should say poses to you guys? Okay, key issue, <laughs> very important, you know, they're talking about safety first. So when we were doing a cool common open ADR, we had to do NERC SIP compliance because you'd have enough load managed. Well, then we stumbled into this little Department of Defense implementation and NERC SIP looks simple. So we have to subscribe to all the Department of Defense cybersecurity requirements. And if you're, there's a, a guideline, if you're operating something on a military base that moves anything, then the server has to reside on the base. So this was a great way for us to start out and say we will be utterly compliant to all the cybersecurity elements that exist. Um, but right away, day one, you know, that became, wow, if you mess that up, you're in trouble. And I, I want to hear that from everyone. Let's, let's. Yeah, I, I would take a different spin. Uh, I, I, I want nothing to do with all of these layers on mm -hmm. some of these government and DOD type projects. Uh, we are, you know, very conscious of um, the security levels. I have a, a guy who's what they call a white hat um, programmer. He lives off grid in New Hampshire and he's our cybersecurity expert. But each of our devices has a, a secure connection into an Amazon Web Services uh, repository and we have security at that level. Um, but some of the requirements at some of the government entities are just beyond what we, we need to do right now um, because the amount of uh, engineering resources versus the payback is, is just not there. So um, we absolutely have to design security in for the individual sites, um, but that is not really related to the safety aspect. There's no way to, to hack into one of our systems and cause a safety concern. If, if communications dropped altogether, you have, you've lost monitoring, but you haven't lost any kind of safety control. So for us, it's uh, safety first and you know, solving a customer's problem, but the overhead to get into some of these larger programs, we're just not, uh, we're not going there yet. Um, so on the, the security side and NERC requirements, I mean, we're a full service provider. I'm not saying we welcome that there's gonna be more business, but um, certainly it's an area we practice already for the utilities to have them meet their certifications. Uh, and I think it's, it's something that everybody needs to be thinking about deeply because you are talking about having pretty massive controls um, to be able to take over a fleet of, of dirge to possibly go the opposite direction from the way they were supposed to go. Certainly you're gonna mess up their, their uh, revenue payments, but you could do an awful lot of other interesting things. And the, the size of the fleet that you manage, certainly, um, and the size of those particular individual assets, what they can do to a particular feeder, um, start to add up to pretty important stuff. So I guess Autogrid's perspective is maybe a little bit unique because we operate really big systems and the problem with taking like 197 terabytes of utility data and then needing to run an analysis on it to do a forecast in a couple hours is you can't do that in a server at the utility, right? You, need, you would need racks and racks and racks and racks of servers. This is not practical, it's not cost effective, it's not practical. So you have to do it in the cloud. Um, but you, I mean, the, the, this, the, the nice thing is this is a problem that's solved every day by any business that does anything at scale, right? You, we, you know, we, you follow industry standard encryption and uh, data protection guidelines. You, you leverage the best of breed technologies. And that, it's kind of, that's like a boring discussion. The control side is where it's interesting. So when you've got a lot of DERs across a big area, um, you have to handle that very carefully. So um, we have several strategies to deal with that. The, the, probably the simplest way to describe it is that you, you, uh, you have to layer things. So the communication out to the individual devices is secured in a, in a you know, best of breed way. Um, we're vendor agnostic, so Autogrid works with lots of different um, types of, uh, of hardware from different vendors. So um, each vendor might have their own kind of different mechanism, and that's fine as long as it's uh, you know, not our problem to, <laughs> to have to land 20 different strategies 
Um, and then you split the system up. So um, all of the SCADA controls of big industrial loads that can follow four second signals are kept in a separate bucket from the controls of everybody's smart thermostats are kept in a separate bucket from the things that control pager switches and the way that they uh, uh, communicate is, is um, uh, secured and monitored in a, in a very particular way. So, I mean, it's really no different than how a big business uh, operates a, you know, an, uh, an enterprise and that's constantly being uh, targeted by hackers and uh, maybe even rogue governments, that type of thing. <laughs> um, with that, I'd like to open it up maybe to the audience and see if anybody's got a question or two to ask any member of the panel, or all of them. Or you're all very thirsty and you want to go downstairs. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, supercapacitor is very short discharge. I mean, it, you know, there's, there's certainly maybe on frequency regulation where you're trying to, you know, maintain a 60 hertz, supercapacitors have some merit to it. But a lot of the battery systems are so big and they can do high C rate uh, charge discharge. So the actual amount of current from a big battery bank that has a decent C rate uh, performance is very, very large. So, um, you know, I think supercapacitors certainly have their place, but they're, no, they're not really a substitute for when you want to start stacking these values. On the one hand, you want to do peak shifting and have a two hour or three hour battery, um, but you also want to then participate into maybe some short duration uh, activities as well. A lithium ion battery is, is I think, a much better solution. housing industry, um, you know, the example of Airbnb and the transportation the example of Uber, and which is providing a service to link supply and demand. So here we're talking about energy, we're talking about flexibility, distributed energy in, in time of the day and demand response. So what do you see as the opt obstacle given the internet of things and everything could be attached talking to internet language, right? Forget about their device protocols. They all speak internet. They all attach to the network. Um, you can have, a, with the back end, the big data, you can instantly match and supply to demand. What are the obstacles to make it happen that I can instantly do that, consumer-based? Um, that's my question. OK, so first of all, I would say the key word is resiliency. All right, so I'm a big fan of microgrids. I'm a big fan of the concept that every house can have solar panels and a battery and carry on effectively most of the time. But electricity is a high demand thing. You need resiliency. So the, that, that begs the question, well, we have a shifting business model, like an Airbnb or an Uber model, where you say people are actually pretty much generating their own electricity. The utility is only, only there for resiliency. But the utility can't go away because it's hard, it's unimaginable to replace that resiliency. So again, I, I love the way you're thinking in the sense that I want a disruptive model because this machine, I had an executive I worked with at one of the major utilities uh, the, that was embracing our open ADR. And she got up and said, you know, everyone's talking about the smart grid and how they're gonna build the smart grid. Well, I got news for you, Cookie. This is a pretty smart machine already. It's the biggest contiguous machine in the world and it's instantaneous and it handles demand at any level. So, okay, she's right on, on several parts. Now it's big, it's effective, it's resilient, it's not clean enough. And can we clean it up faster if we make it a distributed asset? Then the only trick there is, well, of course, we have to come up with financial models for trading the energy. We also have to figure out how, what do you use for resiliency? What is the backbone role of a utility? Do you have a comment on that? So I used to live off grid, and the reason I stopped living off grid is I got, well, okay, it wasn't me. My wife got sick of having to, like, you've got the microwave on and you're doing some dishes and the well pump kicks on and you have to run to shut that microwave off because that DC bus voltage is going to drop below the cutout threshold and the whole thing's going to shut down. Well, I'm not touching that one. 
So, so Clay's absolutely right. In that case, like, it'd be great. I could be off the grid 99% of the time, but if, if occasionally when I happen to be, I'm doing laundry and I've got the microwave going and I turn the vacuum on, you've got this like, really peaky demand. If I could you know, g borrow capacity from my neighbor's batteries when that's happening through wires that I pay somebody else to maintain for me, that's awesome. That's a great service. So well, we, went, we went on the grid. The problem is, uh, so my big VPP in New York, I, I aggregated up three aluminum smelters. So when those things were running full tilt, they drew half a gigawatt of power. I mean, these were, are the biggest industrial electrical loads in, in most places that you find anywhere. They can't self-generate. I mean, they're fed at 138,000 volts across six buses from the, the grid. I mean, you, you have, you, there, there are loads that you can uh, decentralize and disrupt massively, but there are things that you, you just can't. I mean, you, we're always gonna need steel. Steel making uses a huge amount of power. Aluminum making uses a huge amount of power. Uh, treating wastewater uses a huge amount of power. And, and those things, they're, like, they're just not gonna get disrupted the same way that the, the grid edge, the really small but pervasive loads will be. Question on, um, oh, uh, Josh Seidenfeld from PG&E. I have a question, on, it's kind of a buzzword, but um, transactive energy. So would love to hear from uh, y'all what you imagine. Uh, first, I'd love to hear definitions of transactive energy. And second, um, what does a roadmap look like from here to 20 or 30 years in the future? I'm going to cheat a little bit. So if you pay a little bit more attention also what's going on in New York with REV. So what's, what's afoot there is is a policy framework that says that you need, we, we will find ways to compensate you if you connect to the grid. What is it that you offer in creating more of like a, a bus of information and also oppor opportunity. So by and large you need to create a way to pay people or they won't do things that are, that are supportive of the grid. Um, so starting with that, in, and having more assets in a, in a system where you can compensate each other and whether it's Bitcoin or others that make it easier in the micropayment market, I think that's where it's actually headed and um, it, it is, money makes it go around. Um, so those are kind of a few of my comments from what I see. So is Ed Cazalet in the room? Is that order? Right. So Ed Cazalet wrote the book, you know, Transactive Energy. And he's, he's a writer and speaker on the subject. And it's an interesting evolution. It goes back to, are we changing the business model? We're gonna do an Uber here. So electricity for 120 years has been one too many, right? It hasn't changed. It's just the big plants pump it out, the utilities bill for it, they care about the meter, it ends at the meter, done. Now it's going many to one because of distributed generation and distributed elements. People are talking about what, if, what happens when it goes many to many. Can you get resiliency from a neighborhood storage asset? Yes, that's a great idea. Now, you have to reinvent it, so is the utility both the resiliency element and the bank? That's an interesting model. The utility is gonna shift their model to their monitoring and tracking because they've got the meter distribution. They monitor and track the transactions and they're the banker. I, you know, given the pace of change of utilities, the immediacy of that, I'm wincing a little bit when I say that. You know, I know PG&E is a forward-looking utility and probably at the front end of a lot of this stuff, so maybe you should tell us how viable is it that PG&E would become a bank for many-to-many -many transactions of energy with a new business model? I wanted to ask about microgrids. Do you see a major growth trend towards microgrids? Number one, and number two, what companies, organizations would be best suited for them? Yeah, I could jump in. Um, you know, as Adara here, based about 10 miles away, we have a, most of our systems deployed around here in very good, stable grids. But every week we get emails from around the world, and some of those places are great candidates for microgrids. You know, Pacific Islands, Caribbean Islands, people that are putting resorts in that can't handle the power going down four times a, a day, or that they pay um, you know, six, seven dollars a gallon for diesel to be brought in to run diesel generators. So I think um, you know, the concept of a, a microgrid in remote locations, what absolutely. about here in the United States? I'm thinking locally. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, unless it's a, uh, just basically a backup system, a resiliency system, um, I don't see, uh, you know, how it's uh, necessarily taking off. 
so we're doing a fair amount in microgrids, like Miramar. Um, if anybody's familiar, it's about 16 or $17 million with Schneider Electric. That's a resiliency play from a large government that spends a lot on defense. So uh, you, you have to find out what is a microgrid going to mean to the owner operator of it, whether it's an Adara system that is a homeowner that's looking to save the refrigerator or they have someone who um, needs, needs medical uh, devices to keep running. Th those are like resilience plays. We just finished talking about compensation on a transaction basis. Microgrids are currently searching for what's that transaction gonna look like so that they're compensated for all the capital outlay that it required to build a, a functional microgrid. So, um, you know, we're, we're very bullish on it, but it is, is similar to some of the other resources where you need to find ways that the financial models make sense. The first play, the East Coast, there's uh, 83 that were selected on, uh, because of Hurricane Sandy. Resilience play, not necessarily economic yet. I mean, in, unless you have a self-consumption or other role. Island states, yeah. Yeah, with the, on the in the continental U.S., it's tough, right? So you have to figure out some other way to monetize it. Like you, you, you price that resiliency play, but you, so you don't have to by offsetting the cost of, of having to deploy generators that you have to maintain or whatever. But that's that that doesn't do it alone. So you have to be able to to um, access those revenue streams, stack those revenue streams from that um, uh, from that resource. And even if you already have the assets in place, so I. Um, have an acquaintance who has a small hydroelectric plant in upstate New York, and the local utility has to force trip his generators when the connection to the substation goes down because it would island and form a microgrid, and it would just do that, right? The, the governor would, would uh, regulate the generator. It's an old mechanical machine. It's got inertia. Um, and so they, they basically had to take action to force his machine down to not form a microgrid because that, it could be dangerous. You know, it's, They're not planning on that happening. Um, so we, we, long story short, we did a little project to look into, well, could he, could he be paid to keep it running, right? But it, it just, it turned out to be not worth it. The utility couldn't monitor it. They'd have to know that, oh, this thing's autonomous over here and you know, it could be dangerous working on the wires. We'd have to you know, have some other way to shut it down if there's a tree down within the microgrid. So th like, there are a lot of problems. It's, it's a really enticing solution, especially if you live in the Northeast and we're there during Sandy, during that freak October snowstorm that happened the year before, during any of the number of things that, that uh, would make you want to have a, a, a backup a power source like that, but it's uh, there, there are a lot of impediments there. Any other questions? Maybe, yeah, I might, might add one thing. If you can make a substantial online storage system make sense, you're, you're pretty far down the road towards what a microgrid might offer. So if you've got a stacked value that was already paid for through SGIP or other things, or you've got a self-consumption goal, you've had other, basically you've got a stack values. And so microgrids, they have just much more complexity at that on-grid, off-grid uh, moment. Hi, yeah, my question is about um, biomass to energy and if any of you have interest in that or um, what you see as its place in the future of distributed generation? Much like myself, so I'm in transportation energy storage. We have an entire group looking at biomass, and they're, they're very bullish on a lot of things. In California, you've got forests that are going to burn one way or another. What are we going to do with that wood mass, for example? Um, we've got uh, feedstock literally out of the um, uh, livestock in the Central Valley, for example, there's, there's tons of opportunities. And if you go further into it, I've, I've got friends, uh, United. United is in, in investing in what they can do out of the biofuel stream um, to be able to take jet fuel. So a lot of things are going on there. I think it's still early and you're, you're looking and searching always for when is cost parity um, versus something else that's triggering it, like the, the bio wood problem potentially in California. Yeah, I would just add, um, I happen to be out of uh, Flint working for General Motors. My first job out of college was uh, doing GM's E85 fuel system. And so when we went through that process, GM spent millions and millions of dollars changing over all of the components in the fuel system um, and going through qualifications. So, um, you know, I think it, it, was there a carrot at the end of that for GM? They got some credits maybe for E85, but, um, you know, we have the ethanol challenge, I think. Um, so I think we really need to look at, you know, what is the, the downstream cost involved and, and what's the ROI on it? 
So, um, you know, just doing, you know, biomass or um, for the sake of doing it, you know, it doesn't really make sense. There has to be a good ROI on and understanding the downstream cost for that. So unless, there, unless there's any other other particular questions or whatever, I was just going to open one one other last question to all of the panel with regard to the to the source. You know, whether it's a fuel cell or a battery or you know, we heard biomass as well. Like, what what in in your mind for each of you? What do you feel is the is kind of the ideal solution today? And what do you think you would like to see tomorrow in terms of? Uh, a source of energy for for any of the products and our solutions that you're uh, bringing to market today. Okay, so I'm going to sort of hop up a level. I've been uh, working with a Professor Rich Muller, a physicist from Berkeley, very bright guy. He wrote a couple books. He wrote Energy for Future Presidents, and he wrote Physics for Future Presidents. That translates as dumbed down, which I guess we should have seen, huh? But it was it was interesting that. <laughs> The, um, if you look at energy for, for future presidents, what he talks, he does an entire survey of all the sources of energy. And he goes from nuke, he talks about biomass, he talks about implementations of energy efficiency. But you look at it across the board and there were a few realizations that really surprised me. One of them was he's pro fracking and gas. And I said, what the heck is that about? And he said, you know, I'm total clean. I want hydro, I want nuke, I want photovoltaic, I want batteries. And he did some work. As a matter of fact, he started being a climate change denier and said, Frank, as a physicist who'd worked with six Nobel Prize winners, he thought there was too much hype and marketing talk in the analysis of what climate change was. So some of the people around him, including Art Rosenfeld, who, who we lost a few months ago, was the visionary in energy efficiency, challenged him and said, okay, you're a physicist, do the analytics on global warming. So he started this entity called Berkeley Earth, and he did exactly that. He said, started from first principles with raw sensor data with a team of physicists, and he got investment from everybody. Even the Koch brothers invested in it. And guess what? <laughs> Global warming is pretty darn real. And it's a great book. And he was, <laughs> you know, he, he very explicitly published, this is a scary problem. And then that got him aware. He, and he looked into this and he went, looked at China and India. And he said, if we don't fix China and India, it's game's over. You know, you can have the, as we learned in this morning's talk with Steve Wesley, you can clean up California all you want. We're still getting that air from Asia coming over here. So if he said the big problem, and again, Steve Wesley was talking about the number of coal plants built in China per week. The big problem is coal. You gotta get rid of the coal. Did I say something about future presidents? Anyway, so it, he said, let's look at fracking and gas in place in China. Exactly, there we go. And, and his, his numbers look fantastic. You get a ratio of 400 to one, gas is that much cleaner than coal in terms of particulate matter and pollution. Okay, so that's changed my mind to say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at and consider the sources of energy and the sources of storage. And so I'm much more open-minded than I was when I started working with Rich about this. Our software is, is meant to be the middle of the process of integration. We are not battery chemists. I bet a lot of these guys are more battery chemists than I am. So we're not particularly tightly coupled to any chemistry. Someone mentioned some chemistries are more appropriate in certain environments than other. And I'm still pro-nuke, despite what Steve Wesley said. It is clean. And if we lose 40,000 people to car accidents and 100,000 people to respiratory, and we've lost three to nuclear in 50 years, you know, I, I don't think you should just get rid of it. By the way, Rich's startup, Rich Muller's startup is getting rid of nuclear waste. Um. Yeah, to me, that's the problem with nuclear is the waste. Um, so um, when, I, when I got into the battery industry in 2007, it was uh, more than just about climate change, which was barely mentioned at the time. It was because I have a daughter with asthma, breathing, you know, smog, and a brother in the military keeping oil lanes over in the Gulf. So for me, it was about, it's about energy independence and the benefits that come with clean energy while you're doing it. So um, I actually just put a, a blog out last week. Has anybody ever read the Paris 
agreement, you know, because you, you can't turn on CNN or and you can't turn on Fox and, and get the straight story. And 150,000 people have, have checked this out. And I actually then sat down and read it. And uh, so it's pretty, uh, pretty, you know, pretty amazing uh, that so many people have their opinions without having read the document. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, you know, to me, there's, there needs to be a blended solution of clean energy. Um, solar panel prices have just completely plummeted. Batteries are getting, there's no Moore's law for battery. You know, the periodic table of elements does not double every 18 months. It, it has about a 7 or 8% improvement a year. Um, but we're seeing prices just completely drop. That's why I started my company. Um, and, you know, now uh, you're, we're just probably two generations of batteries away from being able to take people off grid right in downtown San Jose. And solar panels are now 400 watt solar panels. And so that technology is improving so fast and scaling up. Um, but not every place is built for solar. You know, you're, you got a house in the forest or, or your northern climate. So there does need to be a blend of solutions, um, natural gas is a great way for us to have energy independence. It doesn't solve you know, a lot of other countries' uh, problems. Um, so I think there, there does need to be a, a blend. Now in terms of coal, um, I'm commissioning a, a piece on this uh, website, Fiverr, a uh, little graphic design piece, to, I think we should dig it all up and make the wall out of coal, <laughs> you know? And, and, and but, but then also have a very aggressive migration policy where millions and millions of people can legally come and go. So. <laughs> a little hard to follow that, yeah. but it sounds like some good, good thinking going on. So uh, the, the thing that, I, I mean, the trends clearly is described over and over again in terms of uh, renewable mixture, um, where storage is going, um, it's kind of a race to the bottom in terms of the, the raw materials to make those resources. What, what isn't getting looked at that I would want to caution or make sure is, is out there is that, that this sustainable energy needs to be sustainable. Somebody actually has to be paid to put this together, run it, manage it, and, and, and the grid, whether you're able to jump off grid or not, um, there is there's yet a, a, an interest and importance in, the, in a common good to figure out how do you fund it in an ongoing basis. So if you look at you know, PG&E and &E in, in their world and what, what they're seeing is you have all these goodness things happening and everybody wants cheaper, faster, cheaper, faster, and yet there are certain things that cannot go to zero, otherwise we won't have the benefits that we need from it. So looking for sustainable business at the same time as a sustainable energy system. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and, and say that the, the ultimate supply is a reduce in demand. So as somebody who's actually lived off grid for a, a sizable chunk of my adult life, the, the, when you can only make on a good sunny day a few kilowatt hours of power that you can store for a few days, it, like every watt becomes critical. I mean, forget about not even having air conditioning. Like I had to have a really small fan let alone no air conditioning. Like it was, I mean, it, it was a big deal, right? So um, when I when and when I was doing my my work with the VPP and before that with the DR business, I'd go into some industrial facility and I'd see tens or hundreds of megawatts of power going into equipment that's producing uh, the, the the aluminum uh, smelter. I was making beer cans, it's beer cans. So. Uh, Oh, I, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Okay. Not 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 knocking the beer, uh, and not knocking the aluminum necessarily, because I, I went through a glass plant that was doing the same thing for bottles. So, um, so you you if you really look at the consumption, you. There, I mean, there. I feel like we are are. Um, there's so much we could be doing that we're not. So Autogrid is an international business. I spent some time in, in, in Germany last year with our our group over there, and we would be in a meeting, and it would get hot, and somebody would open a window. And I thought, this is astounding. This is like the best technology ever. The, the, the window opens, there's a hinge, there's a lock, there's a screen, bugs don't come in, there's a breeze. I'll just, I'll 
take my coat off, I'll open my collar a little bit, I feel comfortable still. Okay, maybe it doesn't work in Singapore, but it's a, um, I mean, like if people would devote a very small amount of their attention cycles to not needing the technology that uses energy to just solve all their problems all the time constantly, I feel like you could uh, gain a, a tremendous boost from that. And because most people, they, they can't do that, that's where you need software to, to, to help with that. And that's something that I think we'll see more of as things become more connected and maybe the room knows that, well, there's nobody in here or there are only a few people in here. Maybe 80 degrees is fine as long as it's not humid. The, ass the assumption is my uh, the assumption is electric vehicle is always going to be clean, but that assumption may not work all the conditions. Depending on the time of the day uh, you're charging, you could induce more emission than the traditional, or more maybe more efficient gasoline power of the vehicle. That's point number one, right? Number two, you know, we were talking about the policy in, in terms of the the climate and so forth. Um, have we taken into consideration in any sort of a clean energy and battery or solar the amount of energy it takes to produce those because they don't grow on automatically like plants right uh, you know so we've got to think about holistically um, compare apple to apple right Is, so you know, I'll just take a big shot speed of jumping up a level guess what <laughs> ground, ground transportation doesn't create as much pollution as shipping does you know so we tend to be myopic we're human beings we're myopic we look at what's in front of us we see if we can do hopefully we try to figure out how to open the window right but sometimes we don't see the big picture nothing and lithium mining is no more beautiful than coal mining you know the process and the cleanness of it is a benefit but the mining part isn't beautiful so yeah i'm, I'm going to agree with you if you look at it holistically we have a, you know we should all be vegans we you know there's there's a bunch of stuff you could do that would affect our entire energy infrastructure that we're just not going to go to we're going to try to address what's in front of us and say we got to get rid of coal that's obvious you know we, we know we can do it we're going to come up with clean sources we're going to come up with storage we're going to use my software right guys my software <laughs> right. um any other comments? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I know we're kind of out of time, but I, I think what's uh, incredible about the electric vehicle is it breaks the chain from, you know, what we use to produce the energy from what's actually driving it. So the battery is a fuel tank, whereas in a, a gas engine, it's pumped right out of the ground or pulled out of a lake in Saudi Arabia, brought right over, and that's what's tran you know, moving the car. We can generate electricity any way we want as a country. We can chop down those redwoods that block my view and just burn them and, and get electricity <laughs> that way. Or we can put solar panels in, you know? I, I know, I'm just, I'm just saying it, we have total control of how we choose to generate electricity. So by having battery-powered vehicles, that gives us that control. And as a country, it's up to us then to say, how do we want to domestically generate that electricity? If there's a last word on it, and EVs and some of the things, I'm kind of dedicated a lot of my world to it, but the beauty of EVs and the work that we're doing is that the last 13 to 17% of grid integration of renewables needs very, very flexible resources. So it's actually cost effective to have more EVs on a grid in order to allow that last part of the renewables. So it's kind of a virtuous cycle. They have some elements to them in their supply chain that uh, maybe can be cleaned up. But what they allow you to do by isolating that fuel tank and the supply for it is um, amazing. And um, I'll stand by that. <laughs> And, and you can recycle batteries, but you can't recycle gasoline. So we, I think we're out of time with all of that. I just want to say thanks very much to each of the panel members and to the audience. Thank you.